go through all of this kind of stuff. And I think probably <coughs> I'm gonna do Jesus friend of sinners, okay? This morning. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put it off again. So our text verse is John 3, 14 through 17. Now we've had Jesus the Son of God, Jesus the Son of Man. Uh, we've had uh, Jesus the Savior, I think. We've had all of these uh all of these subjects about Jesus the Prince of Peace and all of these things about Jesus. If you preach Jesus and him crucified, you're not going to go wrong. Okay? Just preach Jesus. Preach Jesus. I have found out in my years of ministry, the church that I got saved in asked me to leave pretty quickly after I got saved. That was Miss Pierce's home church. And I don't know how they found out about me or where I'd been or what I'd done or who I was, but they did. And they just said, we've, um, we've talked about it. You're not to come back on this property. Well, I made up my mind that night that I would never pastor a church where anybody and everybody can't come. And I told this church 17 years ago, and this is the sixth church that I've pastored. I hadn't, probably hadn't gotten any better. But um, I've told every church, the first person that is told they cannot come to the First Baptist Church or wherever I was. Wherever they go, I'm going with them. Because, friend of mine, we're to be a New Testament church. Someone said to the pastor's conference, our congregation knows this, I want you to know this. We would like to have a non-traditional church like yours. Well, first of all, this isn't my church. On this rock I build my church. Jesus Christ is, is Jesus Christ. Okay. It's not ours. It's not run by the deacons or by the ladies or by the men or anybody else. This is Jesus in the church. We just do what we can, where we are, what we have. And um, anyway, we better get started. John 3, 14 through 17. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever, I want you to understand something, there is not a man, woman, or child who's reached the age of accountability who cannot be saved. You can be saved. I believe in predestination that God predestined us uh, to be like Jesus, to be conformed to his, to his image. Okay? Are you with me? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God uh, so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, well, look at this, but that the world, everybody, every race, every creed, every color, every person, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen? Amen. Now, since we've settled the fact that the homeless can be saved, and the destitute can be saved, and the, and the prostitute can be saved, and the alcoholic can be saved, and the homosexual can be saved. You just write this down somewhere. God does not hate sinners. God hates sin. There's a big difference in that. And we're going to all the world preach the gospel to every creature. You're a creature. But never you're a creature, man. We're all creatures. And God said preach the gospel to every one of them. Number one. Jesus is a friend of sinners. That's the first point. In Matthew chapter 11, there's two verses I want to read, beginning with verse 18. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they uh, say he hath a devil. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous, a man that eats too much, like many of you, never me, but you probably. And a wine giver and a friend. You see that? He's a friend of publicans. He's a friend of sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. The Bible is very plain. But wisdom is proved by her actions. That's what that means. Wisdom is justified. Or wisdom is proved by what we do. Your wisdom is seen whether it comes from heaven or whether it comes from this earth. People who are wise. The Bible says, He that goeth forth and weep, that very precious seeds shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves, bringing his uh, creature, bringing his sinner. 
bringing his Repu uh, uh, Republican. Uh, <laughs> we don't bring Democrats, so we don't understand that. I've got enough problems, but, but uh, bringing his Republicans with him. So, Jesus is a friend of sinners. Somebody say amen. amen. Matthew 9, there's three verses, beginning with verse number 10. It came to pass, as Jesus said to me in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw that, they said unto his disciples, Why eat your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but it's the sick that needs a doctor. Uh, but me telling somebody who's a biker, and by the way, bikers for Christ, uh, we're headquartered here for a long time. We first started this ministry, and we started celebrating recovery then, right after we started this church 17 years ago. This building wasn't here, by the way. That one wasn't there, just that old stone building over there. That's where that's where we met. But it would be like me going to Good Shepherd and saying, oh, I had a heart attack. The doctor said, we'll go home and get well and come on back up here and we'll treat you. No, you take people like they are and where they are. Hello? You take people where they are, for who they are, and you introduce them to Jesus. Now, no man comes to Jesus except the Father, which hath sent him, sent Jesus, draws them. So when people are in church for the mind, and they're not saved, chances are they're being convicted to be saved. Amen? So, Jesus is a friend of sinners. Now, he's also, secondly, uh, he's a friend of the rich. He's a friend of the rich. Now, God loves poor people because he made a bunch of us. Okay? <laughs> and he did. But look, let's, let's look at these ten verses. I know it's a lot of verses, but if you'll listen fast, I'll read fast. Luke chapter 19, uh, beginning verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man... Uh, named Zacchaeus. Well, folks, he was rich, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. He had a lot of money. Now, the rich, Bible talks about the rich, that uh, they shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. And, and not a lot of rich people get saved for uh, I'm thinking probably the reason that they're de not dependent on anybody else and, and they just never needed God and they don't need the church and, and all of that kind of stuff. But this guy was rich. His name was Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. And he sought to see Jesus, uh, who he was. He wanted to know who Jesus was and could not for the press, the crowd, because he was little of stature. Uh, he was little of stature, because the Bible says the wicked shall be cut off. But, and he ran before and climbed up, and don't take that literally as I said that. Um, I just went across my mind. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him, and he said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Now, here's what it's like. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was not right. I mean, he was on the bottom rung as far as uh, being right. Uh, he probably was arrogant, obnoxious, and all of those things. But the the average Christian would have passed Zacchaeus up. But Jesus loved this rich man. And he stopped and he spoke to him like we would on Highway 80 or like we would up here in Kilgore or anywhere else or even in Waterbury. And talked to him, gave him a car, shared with him, invited him to come to church. And uh, But anyway, he stopped and he said, uh, uh, come on down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Now, verse 17. Je 
just jumps out at you if you're thinking about who Jesus is. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, uh, you know, I've had churches call me and say, we've got an undesirable here today. Would you like to have somebody come get them? Are you kidding me? I am an undesirable. You're an undesirable. It's happened time and time again. Preacher, what do you do with people that come and they got shoes? They mean what I do with them. Ask them to sit down. <laughs> Have a cup of coffee. But what if somebody just shows up in some shorts? I'm wearing shorts under these pants. Right now. I do the same thing with them that I do with Roland Bray or anybody else in this church. I treat them like Jesus treated them. This church treats them like Jesus treated them. They saw it. They all murmured, saying that he was going to be cast with a man that was a sinner. Well, friend of mine, they're sinners. I'm sinners. Everybody's a sinner. There's none righteous. And any man that says he's without sin, John said in 1 John, he's a liar. And the truth is, in it. and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Now, if you're Zacchaeus, you're here today, and you get saved, look what Zacchaeus did. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. It's often those who are forgiven who have the little that give the most. I mean, that's just the way it is. We've got people that will say, I don't have any money, but I'm pulling some nails over here in the old building. And by the way, I'm not preaching next Sunday because we're having a Christmas play. And uh, it's all I can do to keep you crying when I heard the rehearsal. Miss Sandy's doing a great job with that play. We're going to have it next Sunday morning. Next Sunday night, 5 o'clock, bring a friend with you. We're having the annual banquet. We've done it every year for 17 years. It's a combination of Thanksgiving and Christmas and come and be a part. Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. In other words, Zacchaeus got saved. This friend of Jesus, this rich man, for as he also was a son of Abraham. If you're saved, you are a son of Abraham. Not everyone that is a Jew is a Jew outwardly because Christians are Jews inwardly, the Bible says. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Could I get everybody to agree that Jesus Christ wants to see the rich saved? <coughs> Amen. And then thirdly, he's a friend of the minority. He's the friend of the minority. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, Then drew near to him all the publicans and, and sinners for to hear him. By the way, they were rich, and they were religious, and they had influence, and they wore those paraclete boxes that had scriptures stuck down in them and walked around to show everybody how smart they were in the Bible, but they were lost. You may be in the majority and be wrong. The children of Israel sent the spies, 12 of them, and 10 of them were wrong. Often the majority is wrong. They were dead sure wrong in the association when they told us a couple of the pastors, association didn't do that, a couple of pastors said, uh, what you're doing out there won't work. You can't have bikers and senior citizens. And I just said, my senior citizens ride bikes, so I don't, you know, it's not something that I'm worried about uh, at all. And, well, you just can't have normal people. Friends, if you ever been to Danville, ain't none of us going. Ain't nobody like that. Then drew, <laughs> I proved that my uh, then drew near to him all the publicans and sinners for the area, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured. That the, that they did that better than anything else. They griped. They complained, saying, This man received sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep, that's the majority, if he lose one of them, that's the minority. Does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. You see, Jesus was a friend of the one. 
as well as the friend of the needy. He was the friend of the rich and friend of the poor because Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And when he had found it, he laid it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he came home, he called together his friends and neighbors saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Verse 7, I say unto you that likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one. Do you see that? Over one. The minority. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. He said when someone comes and gets saved, there's rejoicing over that person who's lost and now they know Jesus than over the rest of us that already know Jesus. Amen. I love it when people come who've never been to church before. We have a lot of them. We've never been in church before. But some of which have been incarcerated, uh, incarcerated, not all. But if they have, it's oftentimes that they know somebody that's here. And they can't believe they're in church. They're not in church because they love to come visit them. They're not in church because they like good music. They're not in church because they like their teacher in Sunday school. They are in church because they got saved. Amen. They know Jesus. They want to be in church. When you get saved, your want to's change. Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. And he said a certain man had two sons. Now this is the minority. He just had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me my portion of goods that fall to me. You know the story. And he divided unto them, both of them. The son that was, uh, that didn't leave, he gave him his portion. Also, and he gave this other kid his portion. And he said, and he divided unto them his living. What he had uh, for those boys, their inheritance. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there he wasted his substance with righteous living. See, first, he did not ask his father for his portion, but said, Father, give me my portion. You know, it would be a good idea. How many of you got teenagers at home that live at home? Okay. Make you a sign, put it on the refrigerator that says, uh, leave home while you still know everything. Okay. I told my mother, I'm leaving. When I was 15 years old, I am leaving. And I'll not be back. You're going to hear some good stuff that I've done. Oh, my soul. I went from place to place and, uh, and did stuff and Biggest mistake ever made was leaving home. My mother loved me. My mother never smoked, never drank, even though I did. And two stepdads did, uncle, brother-in-law. That's just what that's just what we did. But the worst thing you can do, kiddos, is to leave home without planning. Uh, what you do first is get you a job and help mom. Amen. So he had these two sons, and the Bible says, and and not many days after. Uh, the one son just lost his stuff. And, and, and he didn't ask him. He told him. Then the father answers his brother. Uh, when you know the story, he went off and got the pig pen and somebody wouldn't bring him a pick and nick basket. So he stayed in the pig pen and he said, How many of uh, my, uh, my dad's hired servants do better than me? I'm going to go home and I'm going to repent my dad and tell him that I've sinned against him and, and, and I asked him this time. He told him the first time. Hello? Now he's humble. And he asked his dad, can I be as a hired servant? I, I'm tired of manure. I, I'm tired of, I'm hungry. And you know the story. The dad got up and went and met him. That's what God does. Or he'll send somebody to meet you. And that's how God does it. And um, he ran to his son and took him and he said, go kill the fatty calf, go put the robe on him, put the ring on his finger, 
And what they do, they celebrate it. Folks, people get saved in church. We don't celebrate that thing, do we? We should. We should. And just because somebody's in the hall pen don't mean the people in the in the mansions are not in the hall pen too. Amen. 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 They're just not with the pig, but they're with the pig. So the Bible says, the, Bible, the father answers his brother this way, and he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have now is yours. It's not your brother's. All that I have. The brother came and wouldn't come in the house. He's mad because his brother spent his, spent his money in right, righteous living and, and with harlots and all that kind of stuff. The Bible says there's more rejoicing in heaven over that kid smelling like a hog than the righteous people at home. Amen. I pick people up all the time and say, come on, you want to go with me and get a cup of coffee? Sure. They don't ask where and they wind up in church. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. They need this stuff to know God loves them and he's their friend. Number four, real quick, a friend of the majority. Matthew 14, 15 through 21. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, This is a desert place, and the time uh, is now past. Send the multitude away. Friend, that's what church would do. Send the poor away. Send the hungry away. Send the destitute away. Send the needy away. Send them away. Send them away. Why? Because they're not benefiting us. Well, friend, they're not supposed to. We're to benefit them. Amen. We're to feed them. We're so busy feeding ourselves, we forget to feed the people that are hungry. We're so busy visiting ourselves, we forget to visit the people that need Jesus. So send them away. But don't send away the rich or the well blessed or the educated or the tither. Brother, money is the destruction of a many a pastor and many a church. Brother Jim Jack called me last night and they were remodeling the church and literally found in the wall of the church in stockpile. Did you see that I don't know how the story went, but $60,000. Six hundred thousand. 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 Put it in some socks, man. <laughs> Amen. Give it to the First Baptist Church of Danville. Look, 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 here's what they said. Send the multitude away. It's a too big a problem. The, the homeless situation, the uh, offender uh, generation, uh, the courts become too much, the jails become too much. Just send them away that they may go into the villages and buy it themselves. You know, I've got a real problem, and I just told this to the city. I love Goodwills. Goodwills, uh, I, when I first went to ministry, I could go to Goodwill and get somebody to change the clothes and not pay nothing for it. You almost pay as much at Goodwill as you do Walmart Amen. today. I used to be able to go to Habitat for Humanity and say I need a 3068 door, a uh, homeless, I mean a, uh, a, a, a single mom with a couple of kids uh, needs a door, they give it to me. Not anymore. Folks, we're not in the business of selling stuff. We're in the business of giving the work. You know, I just don't think it's scriptural to get something somebody gave you if you're a church now. If you're in the business, make all you make. But if you're a church, you have no business charging somebody for something that didn't cost you nothing. In the first place. But Jesus said it to them, they need not depart. <laughs> Don't you know this blew their mind? Y'all give them something. <coughs> All of these 5,000, plus women, plus children. Yeah, don't send them away. You guys see them. Hello? He taught them a great lesson. Do what you can with what you have where you are. 
It doesn't matter if it's a few pieces of fishes, a few pieces of bread, or if you're a big church with like a cathedral, nothing wrong with that, or if you're a small church like we are, what you do is you minister to the people where you are with what you have. So the whole church sent people away. In that time and this time, but Jesus said, feed them. The multitude, the great numbers of them. I'm telling you, the whole, this entire church, God put together. The uh, second Sunday night of December is when we're going to all get together to celebrate that. We're going to celebrate working with the Baptist Student Missions at Kilgore College. We're going to celebrate the Sunshine Lighthouse, the Christian Women's Job Corps, the funeral, the memorial, the wedding, the grace house. All of those things. We're involved in it. Why are we involved in them? Because Jesus said, you give them to you. You do it. The casinos aren't going to do it. And they say unto him, we have here but five bowls and two fishes. We had less than that when we came here. All we have is an old block building in five and a half acres. Oh, excuse me. All we have is a block building, five and a half acres, and a new building for a kitchen and worship center. I mean, said, oh no, wait a minute. All we have is a block building, five and a half acres, a new building uh, that has a kitchen to worship in, an educational building. You know what God did? He said, you feed them and I'll, I'll take care of this other stuff. Oh, excuse me. All we have is a block building, a 6,000 square foot building, by the way, and a six, another 6,000 square foot building. Um, all we have is is uh, uh, 14 acres uh, back here behind us, and this and that joined together. That's all we have. All we have is a block building, worship center, educational center, a kids camp uh, site, and 44 acres, and God is not finished yet, and he said, just keep on feeding them. sword out and cut somebody's head off before you become friends with them. It's hard to tell somebody that's hungry Jesus loves you. Amen? And he said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit out on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fishes, looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them. And he gave the loaves to his disciples. He gave us a responsibility. We are Christ's disciples. Look what he's given the First Baptist Church of Danville to reach sinners, to reach the rich, to reach the minority, to reach the one, to reach the majority. Jesus is the friend of every one of us. Amen. Y'all mind if I wrap this up? God, please wish you would. Well, it's rather lengthy. And tonight's night, so come back tonight. Because friends, Jesus is a friend of the less fortunate. Of the less fortunate. It's difficult for those who have, as well as those who have not. But some of us are more fortunate, and some of us are less fortunate. So here's what God does. God is the God, God is the God of all comfort. Who comforts us in our time of trouble, 
If we find comfort for them, who are in trouble. The preacher, what's that mean? It means God finds somebody that has a need and finds somebody that needs a need, that's us. And he gives them a need. Amen. We drove a young man, the police department called me. I'm just using a, a very recent example. And they said, Preacher, this guy calls us 50, 100 times a day. He's wearing us out. He calls 911. He needs this. He's, He's drunk. He's drinking vodka. He's doing all that. I said, Well, let me go over. What's his address? And I went over and couldn't wake him up. He was uh, out. I mean, out. So I went back later. And I said, David, I'm going to do First thing to church thing. And I love you. Got a whole church of people that love you. We want to help you. What do you need? And he said, I need to get off the bike. I said, how much do you drink, man? He said, I drink every day. They like the bike. The police come get me on the side of the road. The police come get me out of businesses. They bring me home. I'm an alcoholic. I'm useless. I've served four years. I came back and was talking to Brother Michael Fagan. Brother Michael said, you know what you ought to do? And he said, in the military, carry him to the detox of VA. I didn't know Michael had been there because Michael had been there. But that day, unfortunately, I had this fear for me. Anyway, we carried him. I, I talked to him. He's been over there over a month. And he called me and he said, Preacher, I've got a court case coming up and I need to stay here for a little longer. He said, Well, he just don't want to go to court. That may be. I don't know. I said, don't worry about court, don't worry about your attorney, don't worry about the judge, I'll take care of all that. But you just stay. He said, thank you. In the meantime, I get a phone call from the Kilgore Police Department. Just to say thank you, First Baptist Church, for what you do. We don't know how to handle those cases, and they're not supposed to learn how to handle those cases. But it sure takes a lot of their time. It's just what we do. So we carried him, and then Michael and I went back to get something. I, don't, I forgot. We had to go back to get some medication from him or something. And uh, in the meantime, I called Friday and talked to his attorney. And I asked him when he had a doctor call. He said, today. And I said, well, he's still in uh, the VA. And he said, I'll take care of him. Don't worry about it. And after today, there'll be no more doctor calls left the first three years. You still have to stay as long as you can. And here's what David told me. He said, Preacher, I can't go back home and stay all day and just sit there. I've got to have a job. And friend, if, it, if you can't get a job, we just had a, a felon get a job without an interview. <laughs> Amen. I don't care what excuse you got that you can't go to work. If you want to work, you can work. And if a man won't work, the Bible says he shouldn't eat. If you want to starve somebody to death, just put their food stamps under their work boots. They'll never look back. But that's what First Baptist Church of America does. That's what you do, what I do. If Jesus is my friend, then he's a friend of sinners. Let's stand together. Father God in heaven, you know what the needs of the First Baptist Church of Danville is. You know we need people. You know that we have physicians that's unfilled. Father God, you know uh, the financial needs of the church. And I want to thank you, dear God, for opening the windows of heaven often. God, I want to thank you for this old 1938 school building that's becoming a pavilion. I want to thank you already for this new church and education place. I want to thank you, Father God, for the kids' camp. 